participation. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. So actually, first I would like to start with uh, uh, background and motivation, why we did this research. And actually, uh, a small Swedish company, Context Vision, started around five years, a new unit called Digital Pathology Business Unit, and uh, started applying machine learning and deep learning to cancer-related data, and mostly images, huge whole slide images. And also started participating in different challenges, and last year in May, we got the second place in Chameleon Challenge. And uh, using uh, this experience which we accumulated, we started to develop a decision support tool for pathologists. And uh, typical task which we usually do is like predicting whether there is cancer or no cancer in scanned tissue, segmenting out cancer areas in a scanned image. Thank you. Uh, classifying the cancer into one of several types uh, and also prognostication of patients. So it's typical tasks in digital pathology. And actually, it's very challenging, and uh, we every day uh, face different uh, challenges, such as um, ground truth. There is no ground truth. It's very subjective. But there's always room for improvement, and some ground truth is more objective than other. And also communication. Bridging the gap between uh, deep learning experts, machine learning experts, and pathologists is quite challenging, because it's like two different worlds which we are trying to merge into one. And images are huge. It's, uh, one image can be more than 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So it's uh, challenging to fit that, uh, these images into memory, and it's computationally expensive. And gathering the data is also it's a challenge. There are many ethical approvals, which are different across different uh, institutions and countries. And even more important, to gather reliable, high-quality data with good uh, enough variation. And actually, just to uh, introduce you to prostate cancer. So actually, uh, Gleason grading is used as a clinical standard for grading prostate cancer. And this grading is very subjective, and it suffers from high variability. And uh, actually, there is a effect that the absence of basal cells, actually, glands, they have basal cells, the cells on the, uh, like, base of uh, glands. And the absence of basal cells actually is a strong indicator of uh, prostate adenocarcinoma. And uh, we actually introduced uh, glands without basal cells. As a, so if a gland has no basal cells, we say this gland is potentially cancerous. And actually this uh, uh, definition allowed us to provide, uh, to get more objective uh, ground truth. And the beauty is that to detect with uh, a glands without basal cells. We can use a specific immunostaining, uh, one staining for glandular tissue, so we can segment out glands, and the other one is for basal cells, so we can understand which gland is healthy and which one is potentially cancerous. And uh, I'll try to show you. So, for example, this is an overlay of uh, hematoxylin and eosin image with the immunostained uh, immunostainings. So you can maybe see this. These glands, actually, the green one is epithelial uh, uh, tissue, and these glands actually have some basal cells. It's maybe hard to see, but trust me. And uh, these, uh, actually, glands, they lack uh, basal cells, and even more, uh, this red one is MACR, which is actually a biomarker for uh, cancer. So actually, using this immunofluorescence channel, we can generate uh, ground truth, these red areas is actually uh, potentially cancerous areas. So we use it uh, applying a uh, dense estimator fil filter. And uh, again, so we generate uh, using uh, gl glandular uh, tissue without basal cells, we can generate ground truth, which is more objective. And one of the problems still exists that there is a lot of data variability. So you can see every every uh, row is a uh, different source. You see some images are more pinkish, some are like quite faint color. So there's a lot of variability in uh, h and &E staining. And it uh, depends uh, on a scanner, on uh, the way that uh, the tissue is uh, prepared and stained in the lab. So actually, uh, dealing with this variation uh, is very important. One can collect data from different scanners, different labs, and also use uh, more automatic uh, data augmentation methods. 
So actually, using this uh, um, we call it master annotation method, we uh, managed to generate uh, data for uh, different patients scanned by different scanners for prostatectomies. Prostatectomies is a, a huge piece of pr prostate slice, which is after resection, so it's uh, after prostate was removed. And also biopsies. So why do we use prostatectomies? The reason is uh, prostatectomies provide is a lot of tissue, a lot of data. And uh, biopsies actually are used in clinical practice. So our goal is to predict well on biopsies. And uh, prostatectomy is actually, one prostatectomy can be 40 times more than biopsy, so actually it provides us uh, uh, with a lot of data. And also, uh, so we have data. Next is to train uh, a model which performs well. So actually, uh, so after participating in Chameleon Challenge, we gathered, it, we managed to build in-house uh, framework which actually is quite flexible. We use it for breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal cancer projects. And actually this framework you would ask, like what's special about it? What's allowed us to achieve good results? So actually one of the uh, main uh, feature of this framework, it uh, uses quasi online hard example mining. We call it smart sampling, at least in house. <laughs> and uh, the idea is, uh, let's say if you have, when you train on uh, images, let's say this is annotation, uh, and then you predict on your trained data. And then you actually build error map by comparing your prediction with the uh, annotation. And then actually you uh, sample from uh, areas where the model makes uh, mistakes. So you kind of enforce the model to learn more from the areas which uh, model struggles. And the second actually uh, feature is that we use, uh, we compose models into directed acyclic graph structure. So let's say we train first the model on uh, uh, one resolution, let's say one micrometer per pixel, and then we predict on uh, training data, and then actually we start training another model on, uh, uh, let's say, different resolution, for example, two micrometers per pixel. And then we use uh, the uh, predictions from first model as an input as in one channel for training the second model. And you can see that, uh, for example, this is uh, HNE image, and different models can predict quite differently. They learn different things, and ground truth is, for example, like this. And then these uh, models you can combine into direct acyclic graph, and uh, we uh, actually uh, benefit from this. It's uh, because actually it's equivalent of ensembling, and it allows to uh, combine different resolutions. Also, as I mentioned, there is a lot of variation in HNE stainings, and of course, we apply some augmentation, which, of course, geometric augmentation like rotating, mirroring. Then we uh, adjust uh, color, like using brightness. Uh, and also, we uh, use elastic deformation, but of course, we try to preserve the morphology. We don't want to disturb the image too much. And it's done uh, during the training continuously. <laughs> So, more about experiments. So, we trained uh, several models. So, we trained first model only on prostatectomies. A lot of data, huge images. And then we predicted on, uh, let's say, test set biopsies. Then we trained model only on biopsies and predicted on uh, biopsies. And then we trained also a model uh, we fine-tuned model which was trained on prostatectomies with, the, uh, with biopsies. And uh, we compared results. We tried to understand what's the best way to combine prostatectomies and biopsies. And these are other results. So actually, as I described, we use uh, for this paper uh, two nodes in directed acyclic graph. So we train one model on uh, one micrometer per pixel. And then we actually used the uh, predictions as an input for a uh, compound model, which is uh, one and two micrometers per pixel. So actually for biopsies, for biopsies, uh, sorry, for prostatectomies, you can see the red one curve, uh, this dashed line. It's uh, the, worst, the worst performance. Uh, and once we train only on uh, biopsies, actually the results are better. And uh, for a model which was trained, the model which was trained on prostatectomies and then fine tuned on biopsies, we got the best results F1 score. It's uh, uh, per pixel, uh, calculated per pixel. So, and you also can see that uh, 
compounding models was consistently improving the performance. But the question is, okay, so we have this F1 score. What does it mean? Is it good? Are pathologists happy? So then we actually asked three pathologists to annotate our test set independently using only H&E images. And then uh, we also predicted uh, with uh, the best model which we have, which I demonstrated, compound model uh, on uh, our test set. And then actually we got, you can see in red, it's our prediction. This is for F1 score, this is for sensitivity and specificity. And you can see that actually um, the performance of our deep learning model is comparable to pathologists. This is one of prediction, which is, I take is pa from paper, actually from more examples. So actually you can see there is a correlation between uh, prediction and the ground truth. And even more, this is, I think, the most interesting. Uh, we found, I mean, our model found interesting examples uh, which actually pathologists missed. So for example, this is the ground truth, which anot was annotated by a pathologist who had access to um, immunostaining, so he knew where glands are, where basal cells are, and where MACR uh, was. Uh, sorry, MACR and uh, basal, uh, and uh, epithelial. Uh, sorry, uh, MACR and uh, basal cells, yeah. And uh, then uh, our model managed to predict quite accurately that that gland, particular gland, is potentially cancerous. And same here. And here you can see also correlation. And pathologists totally missed this uh, uh, these areas. So it's interesting why it happened. So to summarize the results so far, that uh, uh, the model produced promising predictions for the test biopsies, and uh, the model performed on par with the uh, three pathologists. And also, it's, uh, we are currently investigating what the model even found missed by the pathologist areas in a few biopsies. So more details you can find in the paper, and uh, you can come and see our poster. I think it's OT4. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> Hi. Um, I wonder what is the percentage of high-grade tumor compared to low-grade tumor in your data set? Because I imagine low-grade is more difficult to detect. And also, do you have uh, so in your negative samples benign lesions which are not uh, cancerous? Sorry, can you repeat? So low. So what is the proportion of low-grade cancer to high-grade ah, okay. cancer in your data? Okay, okay, because okay. I, my assumption is that low-grade is more difficult to detect. And also, do you have benign lesions in your negative samples? Yes, yes. So actually, uh, we actually there's a table in the paper. I don't remember the numbers, but uh, there is actually a distribution of different Gleason uh, patterns or Gleason, uh, yeah, Gleason scores, Gleason scores, sorry, in, uh, which we used for training and for tests. So you can see. I don't remember the numbers, but let's say for test uh, biopsies. Uh, uh, we had like 63, I think, biopsies from several sources from different labs. And we had uh, there uh, and uh, benign and uh, cancerous. And I would say, at least to my memory, I, I might be wrong because I need to see the uh, numbers. Uh, we had maybe more four and four, like uh, higher grade. But I mean, you can check uh, in a paper. We can discuss it because I don't remember the numbers, sorry. Was there another question? It's, it's hard to see from here. Thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, I have two questions. One regarding how robust is the model with respect to the uh, tissue embedding and the um, thickness. And the second is, uh, have you looked at TMAs? Let's uh, start with the first one. So tissue embedding, yeah? <laughs> What is tissue embedding? I don't know. So the tissue, emb the embedding, uh, did you only look at paraffin embedded sections ah, yeah, or yeah, cry yeah, yeah, sections? Yeah, 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 uh, formalin fixed pa paraffin embedded, yeah. yeah. And the thickness? Uh, uh, the thickness, actually, it's a good question because, uh, yeah, it varies from lab to lab, but I would say the average thickness, I think, is like 
four micrometers. I'm not sure, like something like four. But uh, let's say we tissue we have, uh, they would uh, be quite same thickness. But we tested our model actually on quite thick because some labs, uh, like you know, the uh, tissue is thicker. It's like sometimes even like two like uh, layers of uh, cells, so kind of overlapping. But we, what we noticed actually, it's quite hard to say at least uh, for now that it's an issue. Okay, the last one was uh, the TMA. Did you look at TMAs? Uh, actually, it's uh, we looked at TMA actually last middle. Uh, we actually present uh, we had a poster with uh, mid, uh, TMAs, but for lung cancer, for prostate we have not. Uh, uh, looked into it, but I know that there is a paper actually we cited it um, regarding predicting uh, different Gleason uh, scores, I think, on uh, TMAs. I mean, why we don't uh, look much into TMAs? Because TMAs is used in research and we are planning to have a more clinical uh, product. Cool, thanks. Mm. We have time for one or two more questions. If not, I, I was wondering, uh, do you know how, how important is the multi-resolution aspect in your compound model? Because if you just use this, the output and then apply it again at the same scale, that would also already give you more label context, which would yeah, could so also improve results. So I think like in prostate cancer, resolution is very important because it's kind of hierarchical. Yeah? So there are, there are cancer cells, which are, you can see on very high resolution, and glandular glandular uh, uh, glands and uh, you can see on like lower resolution. So how important it is, uh, so let's say we try different experiments like training a model on one uh, micrometer per pixel, then on two, then started with two, then one. And uh, what we noticed actually, of course, combining different resolution always helps. Oh, so, okay, so w one and two or two and one was always better than one and one. I mean, we did not like, let's say, this uh, kind of like, very strict comparison, but I mean, uh, mm -hmm. we usually combine different uh, uh, resolutions, so it can be one, two, four, uh, we try it also 0 0.5, and also when we uh, ensemble, uh, we use different hyperparameters, so like finally that graph can be quite messy, but I mean, it's uh, just like, you know, simple explanation how, I mean, at least what we found one and two is uh, you can train a reasonably performing model in a reasonable time, so it's kind of more kind of for <laughs> educational purposes, I think, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, so in the interest of time, I think we should move on to the next paper. Let's thank the speaker again.